I'm going to be talking about Avebury, this wonderful site just up the road. I assume you all know it. And for those of you, perhaps, who are here for the first time, you must make sure that you have a look at Avebury and its associated ancient sites. Now, as Anthony said, I, I knew from the first time that I went to Avebury that I was going to write about the place. But it took, uh, it took another 30 years to develop my understanding to a point where I felt I had something to say. And fundamental to that was the archaeology. The archaeologists have done a lot more work on the site, and we've finally got the dating, the chronology. They only came up with um, radiocarbon dates for Silbury Hill in the last year or two which was a fantastic step forward. And um, the advent of uh, astronomy programs that um, I could run on my computer and save me the trouble of doing all the mathematics. So this research is very much grounded in the data, the archaeology and anthropology of Avebury, and the astronomy. But don't worry, I'm not going to lose you in the mathematics, OK? That's a promise, the gentleman at the back. <laughs> so Avebury, our ancestors and the stars. And as you're all probably well aware, work on the prehistoric sites in Britain has shown how interested in the heavens um, were our ancestors. You know, it's long known uh, the interest um, in the solar cycles at Stonehenge. They've been writing about it for years. And the work of people like Alexander Tom has shown how deeply our ancestors were involved with the lunar cycles too, how closely they followed not only the sun, but also the moon. The, the sun and moon were their daily fare. Everything they did was coordinated according to what was going on in the sky. You know, and not just the calendar. The sun and the moon, of course, formed the rhythm of the day and the night and the seasons the moon, the weeks, the months, but also their relationship with the gods, with the divine powers. However they perceived these powers, it was the heavens that was an indicator of this divine presence, as well as the earth, but the heavens too. We have to remember the sky brings storms. The sky brings lightning. The sky can bring all kinds of well-being and trouble. So our ancestors' lives were governed to a large measure by what came from the sky. And so close, by necessity, was their interest in the heavens, and so deep and so long-standing was their observance that I became convinced that they were also profoundly following the stars, that their star knowledge was as great as their stellar and their lunar, sorry, their solar and their lunar knowledge. And, well, the story really began in my hometown, Glastonbury, where I became very interested in an ancient mound that's on the fourth hill of Glastonbury. On the summit of Windmill Hill, there's a mound. Nobody knows anything about it. But what is interesting is if you stand on this mound and look at Glastonbury Tor on the horizon, it's well placed for the rising of sun and moon and stars. So I've put up here, 
for example, how um, in the late ooh, in the late fifth millennium BC, the three stars that formed the belt of Orion were rising up the steep northernmost flank of the Tor. I thought that was rather neat. And as you know, the, the belt of Orion points to the brightest star in the sky, Sirius. And Sirius rises after Orion uh, in the same location on the horizon. And, oh, it'll take me a minute to get the hang of. And I noticed that from the mound on Windmill Hill, that over a period of a few thousand years, over the tour, that Sirius moved due to procession from rising on the back of the tour around, well, 4,200, 4,800 BC. So by the end of the fourth millennium, it's rising up the steep northern flank of the Tor. So the angle of star rise is marked by the angle of the steep northern flank of Glastonbury Tor. Now the interesting thing about this particular alignment is that it coincides with the rising of the midwinter sun. So in this diagram, courtesy of Robin, um, we, have, we have a demonstration of how from the mound on Windmill Hill, the sun can be observed rising up the northern flank of Glastonbury Tor at midwinter. So this is the lowest point that the sun reaches in its uh, path across the eastern horizon. Now, um, this is for about the year zero. But in prehistory, say 2000 BC, 2000 years earlier, the sun wasn't so much rising up the side of Glastonbury Tor, but was rising slightly below it. And to see the sunrise at winter solstice, it would have been necessary to cut a few little notches in the side of the tour. And then you would have seen the top rim of the sun flashing in the notches. And this would have enabled some quite precise astronomy, some quite precise calendar keeping to be done at this date. And we know, again, from the work of people like Alexander Tom, that this kind of event interested our prehistoric ancestors a great deal. And around about 3200 BC, the rising of the winter solstice sun coincided with the rising path of Sirius, which in some traditions is known as the sun behind the sun, the esoteric sun, the inner sun. Now, just dwelling on this alignment for a little bit longer. Again, we're standing on the mound on Windmill Hill, looking at the tour. And the interesting thing about the winter solstice sunrise up the tour's flank is that at this moment in the 26,000 year thereabouts, cycle of procession, the winter solstice sun is over the galactic center. In other words, due to procession, the date when the sun is over the galactic center changes over the course of the 26,000 year cycle. And it's only in this era that the rising of the winter solstice sun, the position of the winter solstice sun, coincides with the galactic core. 